all and welcome to this short session on fire safety training for first responders and fire marshals. This is specific to Leyland. I'm going to go through some of the roles, evacuation process, uh, fire spread, fire extinguishers and also a little bit on refuge points and emergency evacuation for disabled. Now there's a lot of standards and regulations around <coughs> that are in place to try and improve and reduce the potential for fire and, and emergency situations. So this is about fire risk assessments that need to be done. And then from the fire risk assessments, making sure that we comply with the regulatory form fire safety order and, and making sure that we, we do this over a long distance, should we say, rather than just a quick snapshot in time. So. This is basically what I look at when I'm doing a fire risk assessment and the design of the building and make sure that the systems and procedures are in place and ultimately they work. And then as you can see at the bottom of that list, trained staff who have responsibilities or know what to do and when to do it. So um, I start off with the typical fire procedures. Um, they will look at when the fire alarm is activated, what happens who's responsible for doing what, but ultimately it's, it's about getting people out of the building. And the fire and rescue service would like to just stand outside the building and put the fire out from there, if that is at all possible. But sometimes it requires uh, staff to intervene to assist members and also uh, sometimes visitors and vulnerable people such as physically impaired or hearing impaired so they can get out safely and that's the most important thing but part of it could be though to assist in that would be to go back into a potentially burning building to help people out but also it could be attacking a fire in an attempt to put the fire out as well so there's a few ideas around who does what i tend to say a fire marshal is the person in charge the first responder is the one that will go around and do a feet uh, a sweep of the area or it could be a fire warden that you've dedicated to do specific roles. Um, with that in mind, we have to think about call challenge. And that means that prior to the fire brigade or the fire and rescue service coming out, this uh, they need to have confirmation, usually by two phone calls, that says that it has it is in fact a real fire rather than a, a false alarm. So that can sometimes delay for the right reasons so the fire brigade are not tied up, responded to false alarms. But nevertheless, this is UK wide standard. And therefore, please make sure that when the fire alarm goes off, once you've confirmed that it is in fact a fire, that at least one person, possibly two where you can, phones 999 and asks for immediate response. So I mentioned before that I have to do a fire risk assessment. Just updated it again as a result of the changes upstairs on the first floor where we've made it more open plan that we've put the park area into position. We still have the two fire exit routes upstairs, which take us down protected corridors. Please bear in mind that the main stairwell from reception through to the upstairs is not a protected area. So it wouldn't be considered as part of our fire means of escape, emergency response. But nevertheless, there's more than adequate for the number of people that are on site. As part of our duties, we have to check that what we put in place in terms of control measures are adequate. So part of that is to do weekly uh, fire sounder checks and fire alarm tests, um, which I'll just quickly show you in a minute. We need to know that it will, when activated from either, either a manual call point or from the detector heads, that it will in fact do its job properly. There's also the aspect of when you get outside of the building um, to go into the the uh, assembly point which is at the far end of the car park at the front of the building. So just a quick uh, video to show you what happens in the uh, sounder test that we do on a regular basis. So someone will go to a, a, a manual call point and with a, a, a plastic key will set off that call point while there's another person, uh, typically a duty manager, stood at the um, fire alarm panel and this is what they will do. So uh, first of all, 
the it's been set off um, they'll click on the acknowledge pin they'll then put in the allocated button which is written underneath the fire alarm panel once that's been done they'll press the reset reset button and that will do a silence of the alarm if if it's a detector head particularly when it's a false alarm but if if indeed it's a fire um when you try to do a reset, it won't allow you because something's not right. So it's it's kind of like foolproof in that respect. But nevertheless, the sound tests have to be done for a couple of reasons. First thing, it has to be done um, to check that the sounders can be heard, as you can perhaps hear in the background there. And secondly, that um, the manual call points that are based around the building, we have to activate one uh, of all of the 12 that we have um at least once a year so it's it's making sure that the manual call points work and also the sound can be heard around the building so um over and above that we have to think about means of escape and we have as i mentioned earlier the two protected corridors from upstairs so there's one leading to the back of the building and then there's one going to the front of the building um, but that is behind a wall, behind a fire door, and it's protected. So that's great in that respect. It does its job. Um, but you also have the final exit doors. You've got two in the female changing rooms, and you've got two in the male changing rooms as well. And then you've got another uh, at the rear of the building, and then you've got the um, plant room. You've got a fire exit for the people working in the plant room as well. So there's quite a few dotted around and certainly uh, sufficient for, for what we need. Um, so just a couple of pictures here. I mentioned, you saw the fire panel before, just above the fire panel, there's a copy of the zones. So it will indicate which detector head has gone off in which particular area. And that should aid the response of the first responder to be able to then go to the area and confirm that it is in fact a fire. And this is where it's important that we have some form of communication, because if somebody stood at the fire panel and the other one's doing the running and checking the building is, is empty, um, then whilst they're doing that, they're going to do perhaps the ground floor as well as the first floor. That's a lot of footage to cover. So um, we need to make sure that we can direct that person effectively. And then secondly, we need to be able to communicate. And that's done either by the mobile phones or by the radios. So please make, make sure that you, when you're moving away from reception, um, that you have one of those with you so that effective uh, emergency response can, can take place. Um, just put this picture in about the, the modification upstairs near the park. Um, you'll see on fire doors that above the fire doors, it has uh, an illuminated sign. Fire doors should be there to protect and they should shut and they should shut properly and close securely. And some of them will have uh, clamping mechanisms or security me mechanisms on them as well. But nevertheless, each fire door usually has a sign on it. So if you look at the bottom one here, and again, this was an, it, it, this one is upstairs leading to the back exit route. It has a fire door sign on it indicating it should remain shut. It has an illuminated, illuminated sign above it. Uh, usually it will have fire extinguishers close by and quite often you will have some kind of mechanism to help it stay shut, as well as a self-closing mechanism that pushes the door towards closing effectively. We have fire extinguishers dotted all over the place. Uh, I've organized for the right extinguishers to be available for the risks in those areas. So you don't have to worry about which one you pick up and use. It's just a, um, there's one available, just grab it and use it. So here's a very quick video on the opening of that door. So you can see where we are upstairs. When you open that fire exit door, it leads then straight down the stairs to the final exit door, which you just can push open um, in the event of. Here, if we've opened the fire final exit door, then the next thing is to consider what our route is to get to the 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 uh, the fire point, should we say, uh, where people can collect and come together uh, and help us with our head count and doing a roll count of 
members being off site and safe. Now, bear in mind, as said before, that the fire brigade will want to fight the fire from outside because then all the fire officers are not put at risk. Um, and you need to confirm to them that people are in fact out of the building, which is a point I'm gonna to come to later when we talk about refuge points. So the next bit is about plans. We need to think about what we're gonna do and practice it and know what we're doing before we, we get to an emergency situation. So those are the questions I typically ask when I'm doing a fire risk assessment. And then if I'm giving you the responsibility of uh, responding to those situations, then you need to know what to do in the variations on a theme. So the kind of thing that will last there is the fire alarm's gone off, it's activated, uh, who's where, what do we need them to do? So a duty manager and another, if we've only got two members of staff on site, will do the sweep. Um, hopefully one can spend time at the panel to confirm where the uh, zone is, and then the other person can do the running around to check that it is in fact a fire. Then the second aspect of it is for that person to do a sweep of the area, particularly when it's confirmed to be a fire, to assist members to get out safely. So let's say you do the up, upstairs area, you'll be pointing them in the direction to the two exits, where the person in the downstairs area, particularly in the wet area, will ask them to stay inside the pool area, a low risk environment, until it is confirmed to be a fire. And then when it is confirmed, and there's the potential for that fire to spread towards the wet areas, then they will make the way out of the building through the uh, changing rooms and use the final exit fire doors from the changing room straight to the outside. So the, it's a basically about who does what and how and making sure that effective communication takes place throughout. So a first responder checks the area and, and sees if it's a, an actual fire or not. They might be required to assist people to get them out of the building if they have problems. Um, it could just be good communication. They may be required to investigate and confirm that fire is in fact in the building. And then it's about crowd control, making sure that people stay outside. Because sometimes they say, oh, I've left my bag, I've left my property, I've left my things in the locker. I'm sorry, but in the event of not putting them at risk, we'd rather you stay outside the building until we've had a confirmation that it's safe to go back inside. Um, so monitoring final exits to make sure people don't run back in. The other bits and pieces might involve uh, putting on the uh, IV vests or jackets, um, do the sweep of the area to make sure that it is in fact a fire and the building is em empty, turn off in and isolate any equipment or like a gas pipe or electrical supply that could contribute to fueling or ignition sources. Uh, check all the rooms, toilets and refuge points to see who's still in the building if you've not been able to uh, effectively get everybody out. Um, communicate to everyone concerned. Uh, attend the post evacuation debrief meeting. This is an aspect that we're particularly important. We want to learn every time we have a fire drill and we practice it, we want to learn what could be improved. And the variations, what could be, you know, you might put a role play to then say, let's do an evacuation to test something. Can we get somebody who's disabled, for instance, down from the first floor because we can't use the lift? So if we're not using the lift, how are we going to get them downstairs safely in the two protected routes? Uh, and then thinking about what might go wrong with them. And then what about the alarm itself? Does it sound effectively and, and do the job? So first priority, as bearing in mind, call challenge saying before is to phone 999, but also don't be selfish, raise the alarm. If the uh, detector heads haven't gone off, just press the manual, the manual call points or the brake glass as the more commonly known. Um, fight the fire only if you feel competent enough and confident enough to do so and leave the building by the nearest means of escape, go to the assembly area, and that, that's the, the typical approach. But if you have to go into the building where it's potentially on fire, then and you're just sweeping the area to check that the area is clear of anybody, there's nobody left in those areas, then you must be aware of our principles behind this. You can only do that if it's safe to do so. So use your senses. If when you're walking towards that area, you can smell or you can see the signs of combustion, flames, smoke, then that's it. Just turn around to get out. 
That's all we're asking you to do. If there is a fire and it's a small fire and it's contained and you feel confident, then fair enough, have a go. But don't put yourself at risk. Make sure that you have a safe, sure safe exit route all the time. Um, report your responsibility if you have special duties. Use safe techniques to check doors. That means rather than touching a door and grabbing a handle, use the back of your hand to see if you can feel heat and perhaps approach it low down so that if there is a overspread of, of the fire or smoke as, it, as you open the door, you're not going to get burned or overcome by, by the smoke itself. Call into the room, particularly in change rooms, things that have the sensitive with that. Hello, is anybody in there? Can you hear me? Um, we need you to get out, so make it clear that the fire alarm is there for a reason. It's not a false alarm and they need to get out as quickly as possible. And after that, then walk out and keep checking and, and think about the sensitivity, particularly of opposing uh, sexes going into the various changing rooms. And then when you've done that, communicate, 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 go back to the, the lead fire marshal and make sure that they know. So I've just done a short video here of me walking into the, um, the, cha the male changing rooms. And at this point in time, just look at the potential. There might be people in the showers. They might just be coming out of the showers um, and just past the shower itself. As you turn left through that door, that's the first fire exit point at that point. So maybe um, think about the fact that people don't want to ev evacuate because they're not fully clothed and you've got to kind of persuade them and, and particularly the sensitivity of it. If it's a female in a male changing room and vice versa, a male going into a female changing room. So try to have some authority and, uh, and at the same time, be aware of the concerns that they're going to raise. And what we're basically saying, look, the building's on fire. We need to get out. It's simple as that. And I appreciate you're in an awkward position, but let's get out and we'll try and sort it out once you're safe. So with wet areas, we don't want, particularly if it's a false alarm, we don't want people going out unnecessarily. So we need to know and confirm that it is in fact a fire. And what we'll say is it's a last resort to ask members in swimwear to evacuate outside. So we'll only do it when we really have to. So they stay inside the, the pool area itself. They don't have to be in the water, but they stay inside the pool area until they've received more information. So again, it's important about communication to know that it is in fact a fire inside the building and that we've got the radio or we've got the mobiles to give us more information as this starts to, to grow and grow into a more crisis situation. Once that is confirmed, then fair enough, we need to instruct them to leave the building through the change rooms to the nearest fire exit route. Then once outside, uh, we need the foil wraps so they can have some privacy and also thermal protection, um, whilst particularly in inclement weather, very cold weather and so on. So, so the foil wraps play an important part in the wetter evacuation procedure. Okay, so just a little bit on the fire triangle, you need the three elements to be in place, oxygen, fuel and ignition source for a fire to start, but also think about fire spreading, conduction, convection, radiation and direct burning. So this, this picture here shows those four variations. So direct conduction it could be through um, metal going from one room to another, and that can conduct and start a fire into another compartment. Convection is literally hot air rising, so you can get uh, a fire on the ground floor and it spreads to the first floor because of the heat that's being generated. Then you've got horizontal radiated heat that can be the source over this side, and because of the heat coming across, it can then create a new fire uh, as a result of the heat movement. And then finally, you've got direct burning of fuel next to fuel next to fuel, so it just keeps going as in firewood. So as we've got an unprotected stairwell next to the lift area, the disabled lift to get up to the first floor, this convection can become a problem. So if we've got a fire on the ground floor, it can spread upstairs. Key hazards around fire, the smoke and the, the fueling of the fire takes in a lot of oxygen. So quite often in, in small environments or restricted areas, you get oxygen depletion, You've got flames and heat themselves that can cause burns, smoke. Um, a lot of people die as a result of inhaling smoke more so than the, the burns, first of all. 
uh, gaseous combustion products. So in the smoke now, particularly from modern plastics and the likes of, there's a lot of nasties in the, uh, the combustion itself, but the smoke created. And as a result of that, it can be very hazardous if you indeed you do survive. Um, and then finally, structural failure of the building because eventually it's going to uh, burn the place down. So the consequences, burns, inhalation of smoke, toxic fumes and death. Other consequences, building damage, uh, damage, loss of business and jobs, transport disruption, environmental damage, flora and, and fauna damage. So those are typical consequences of a fire. But ultimately, the important thing is get out, stay out, call the fire brigade and let them sort, sort it. The unfortunate thing about fire is it doesn't make an appointment. Um, it tends to happen much more at home than it does at work, but still there's been quite a few disasters in workplaces. All big fires start as little fires. So if you can intervene because the, the detector head has gone off and you can get there quickly before it starts to spread, great, if safe to do so. Um, people die regularly in fires. Thankfully, it's getting less and less on a yearly basis, but still it happens. And most die from inhaling the smoke before the effects of, of the burning take, take uh, advantage of. And um, knowing what to do can save lives. So that's great. I'm not saying be a hero, definitely not saying that, just following procedure and perhaps picking up a fire extinguisher and having a go can make a big difference. So typically when we tell people there's a fire alarm going off, what do they do? Well, they evacuate. Um, Sometimes people tend to think it's not a real fire, it's probably just a test. And because of that attitude, it means that we have to communicate more effectively and sometimes more urgently to get the point across. But the key thing is that we react correctly. And I, I just using this one, 1971 um, in Woolworths, the uh, fire was spreading upstairs, the smoke, nine people died upstairs on the floor where the restaurant was. And it's believed that people were slow in getting out because they paid for the meal, or they were waiting for the meal. And even though staff said, I'm not hanging around, it's time to get out, they chose to ignore that and, and said, oh, it's a false alarm. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it, it killed them. Um, the other aspects, it's a very busy environment, you could probably see from a diagram there. And the lady that died all on her own was just, as we believe, confused, didn't know where to go, couldn't see the fire exit routes because of the smoke when it was coming up through a, a propped open door um, in one of the stairwells. So it's hard to overcome some people's attitudes towards fire. So try and put a bit, bit of urgency in the way you communicate, uh, but ultimately look after yourself. So the use of fire extinguishers, first of all, it's always voluntary. Um, it's important to raise the alarm first before you do anything. Um, don't let the fire get in between you and the safe exit. So make sure that remains clear all the time. It should be used to aid your escape, more so than uh, trying to put a fire out. So think of it from that perspective, but also you need to feel confident as well as being competent at doing that. If it's a small fire and you can interact early on, just use one extinguisher, just because there might be two there. It doesn't mean you do one and then you have a good second one and keep going, try and find a third one. No, one extinguisher and that's it. If you can't put it out, then it's probably going to grow to a much bigger fire. So just let it grow, but get out safely. If you're aware of different types of fire extinguishers, then you can control some of the hazards associated with it. So different extinguishers are designed for different types of fires. I've done it in the fire risk assessment, so you don't have to think about which fire extinguisher you use. You can just literally go to it and pick one up and have a go. It will take 30, 45 seconds, but maybe some cases a, a minute on the larger extinguishers for them to fully expel the contents of the extinguisher. So this is why I'm saying it, it doesn't seem a long time, but in an emergency situation, believe me, you will know. Just use one, get out. And that's, that's all I'm saying. On the side of, of the extinguisher, there is some icons that gives you some good information. But the method in which it works, it either starves the fuel, 
it smothers it by removing the oxygen, a chemical reaction quite often, or it cools it down. So water is a classic example of that, but also CO2, which comes out very, very cold, helps in reducing uh, the temperature a lot. On the side of the extinguisher, it shows you the typical icons and simple information. So you've got the diagram as well as the information that tells you what to do. So pull the pin out, aim it at the base of the fire, squeeze the lever. The variation on that would be, if I was to go back to the um, CO2 extinguisher, um, on the horn of a fire extinguisher, it's a CO2, carbon dioxide, it's very, very cold. So don't hold the nozzle because you'll get freeze burns if you try and hold the nozzle. Okay, so it does vary. The important thing is read the information on the side of the extinguisher before you use it to attack the fire. So remember, raise the alarm. Ensure that people are evacuated wherever you can. Make sure someone's called the fire brigade and that way, hopefully, it'll get uh, everybody out in a safe manner. Now, we have a variety of different fire doors on site. Um, they will offer typically about an hour's protection. Um, there are variations on a theme, but some of the key things about them, they have self-closing devices, they have perhaps locking mechanisms on them, and they tend to have uh, intumescent strips that swell because of the heat and create a good seal around the edges. And also it usually says fire door keep shut. So it has some characteristics that are quite evident about them. Um, with fire doors, what I tend to say is do regular monthly checks to make sure that the self-closer pushes the door all the way in. The mechanisms that are on it actually work effectively. If you've not got a good seal, then smoke and heat can, can burn through and therefore you've compromised it to maybe 15 minutes rather than an hour's protection. Okay, so we have two refuge points. Refuge points are needed for people who are physically impaired and can't get out of the building unaided. Um, the idea is that if, if they're gonna be slow trying to get out of the building, and then you've got a stampede of people trying to get past them, it could be that they can get hurt in that um, speed of movement, trying to get past them and so on to get out of the building. So the last thing we want is them to be hurt during evacuation. So I know it's a challenge from a moral point of view, but what we're gonna do is leave them inside a potentially burning building, vulnerable people um, to look after themselves for a short period of time until we can organize for two or three, perhaps four people in, the, uh, in their capacity to go back into the building and help them out. Now that's only okay if we've got them in a low risk fire environment. So the two upstairs are behind the fire doors, the next to the fire exit uh, escape uh, stairwells. So there's enough space there for a wheelchair or a person that might be on crutches, for example, to just move to the side out of the way whilst everybody else goes out. And then once that's done, they can make their way out. And then we can gather a few people back together and say, would you help us to go back inside in a low risk area? And what we're gonna do is get that person out of the wheelchair and bring them down. And maybe someone else will carry carry the wheelchair as well. So that's typically what we're meaning from um, physically impaired and needing, because it's above ground, you know, on ground level, it's not an issue because they can make the wear it safely. It's just above ground. And as we've got that on the first floor at Leyland, uh, we, need, we need to make sure that that's in place. So in summary, fire deserves respect. Treat all alarms as the real thing until you're told otherwise and it's been proved that it's a false alarm. On discover of fire, raise the alarm, call the fire brigade, leave the building, other than the people who have to do sweeps and checks. Know all your escape routes. Fire prevention is always better than firefighting. So what I mean by that is do your regular checks on your sounders, on your fuel sources, on wiring in office areas that could all contribute towards the increased risk of a fire taking place. Fire prevention is much better than firefighting. Everybody carries the responsibility for fire safety. Uh, hopefully you'll do your bit, please do. Uh, I know we're relying on you in, in that respect, but if you've got any concerns or, or questions you want to raise, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to give you further assistance or further training or practical advice. Okay, so thank you for your time. Um, and hopefully that's gonna be something we can 